Hello and welcome to another RTS Yorkshire Talks and today it's we've had phenomenal weather recently it's been really really hot and today it is a really miserable Yorkshire day but that day for me has improved immensely because today I'm talking to Peter Wright who is one of the Yorkshire vets uh, a production by Daisy Beck Studios based in Leeds so I'm delighted to welcome Peter here today for one of these Yorkshire Talks so Peter, well, first of all, I always forget to say who I am and I wave my arms an awful lot. I'm Fiona Thompson and I'm chair of RTS Yorkshire and now I'm delighted to welcome Peter here. So, Peter, thank you for joining us today for one of these talks. You're um, very welcome, Fiona. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. And tell me, how are you and Linda managing during and the rest of your family managing during this, uh, this coronavirus time? Well, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, really, but lockdown hasn't been a major problem uh, for me because i'm surrounded by sheep and loads of wildlife and birds and we've had the most fantastic time really i'm just across the road from the onset of the north york moors national park so really i've got to say it's been quite pleasant really because i've a busy schedule of work and one thing and another uh, with filming and so it's been quite pleasant to uh, to stay at home there's one proviso in that, in that my wife's a very, very keen gardener. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, but she's uh, a very knowledgeable gardener. So I'm just a labourer. So she's had me out there from dawn till dusk, flogging away every single day. Um, so I have actually become quite fit during this process. And I must admit, I have quite enjoyed myself being, just being at home. Well, that's quite lucky, isn't it, really, in many ways, because A, you're a key worker, B, you're getting fit, which the rest of us probably aren't getting quite as fit as, as uh, during this period. But uh, And you've got that beautiful vista that, that surrounds you all the time. And, of course, you're Yorkshire-born and bred, aren't you? I was born, well, if I look out of my window uh, across the Vale of York, and I can see right across the Pen, I have a fantastic view. But if I look just down in front of me, about a mile from where I live now, is the house in which I was born. So it's fair to say I haven't moved far, really. <laughs> you haven't, have you? But you, you've moved far in terms, of, in terms of your life and your job because you were trained by Mr. James Herriot himself, weren't you? I was very lucky, really. And uh, it's just the fact that I was born in Thursk and in those days everyone just went to the local schools. And I was very fortunate in going to Thursk school at the time I did. And I wasn't one of the, uh, these children that wanted to be a veterinary surgeon from when they were in the nappies. I really didn't give it much thought. I mean, I was just having a whale of a time, as children did in the countryside in those days, building dens and what have you, and just enjoying them, going out and playing football and cricket and all things like this. So it wasn't until I got into the sixth form when I had to consider what I was going to do. And the head of careers who taught Alf White's son, Jim White, um, he stopped me in the corridor one day and said, uh, Peter, um, what are you going to do when you go to university? And uh, I said, I haven't really thought about it, sir. He said, well, uh, what about dentistry? And the thought of looking in people's mouths all day just filled me with horror. So he said, move swiftly on from that. I think I didn't even need to reply. And he said, uh, what about veterinary science? And I said, hmm. I said, I quite like the sound of that. And he, he, with having taught Jim White, he said, I'll fix up for you to go and spend a day with them, uh, with Jim and Alf White at the surgery. I mean, I knew them anyway through my farming connections. And uh, I went down there, and from walking in through the door at 23 Kirgate, which is now the world of James Herriot, um, walking in through the door, I thought, wow, this is for me. It just had everything. It had a real buzz about the place. The phone, phones were going, there was vets going out to calf cows, other vets operating, the phone was going non-stop. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And if they said to me, look, bring your sleeping bag and stay, I would have done, because I just fell in love with it, with it from with being there for half an hour. And um, of course, working for James Herriot, which I ultimately did, was really um, just the icing on the cake. But it was, it was more than that. It was not only being able to work at home in the wonderful North Yorkshire countryside that we have, but it was the people as well, the characters that I knew. So it, it, it was just ideal for me, really. And, you know, being a veterinary surgeon, you've got to have 
Um, I won't say I'm intelligent, but you've got to have a little bit of nouns and, and, and of course, using my brain in the countryside, in the area that I love, it, it just had everything for me. Yeah. And and how long have you been been a vet now? Because I watched a program the other day that say uh, where you said you've been doing it for thirty eight years. Well, it's thirty nine years now, Fiona. Thirty nine. Um, yes. <laughs> and it's um, uh, but the thing is, I never tire of it um, because you may go to carve a cow or lamb a ewe, but but the, each one is totally different. Each one, even though the procedures are often the same. Each one is slightly different, dealing with a different character of animal, a different character of farmer. And, and this is what I find so enjoyable. It's the variety of my work that really has made my life so pleasant. Yeah. And one of that variety that you can't have expected is the, uh, the contact made by Daisy Beck Studio suggesting that uh, you get cameras involved. How did that happen for you and how did you feel about that? Well, I'm going to be brutally honest here, Fiona. When I was contacted in 2014 by, uh, by email originally and uh, to say that, that Channel 5 had commissioned Daisy Beck to make a television programme entitled The Yorkshire Vet. And uh, my first reaction was to say no. Alf White um, had had... Alf White wasn't a chap who enjoyed the media, he shunned publicity. And I suppose from his dealings with the media in general, from which he shunned. I suppose that, that rubbed off on me to some extent, having been through the majority uh, of, of the peak Harriet fame. And, and so my initial reaction was to say, no, um, I don't think it's for us. And I discussed it with my two partners, I have a partner called Tim Yates, as well as uh, Julian at that time. And um, we, Julian was uh, relatively keen, a little bit apprehensive, but relatively keen. Tim, my middle partner, who's been with me for 35 years only, uh, he, uh, he, he didn't want to be involved at all. Tim's a very quiet, shy chap. So he said, look, look, count me out. Whatever you decide, count me out. So I respected that. Uh, but then the lady came to see us. And um, to put it in Yorkshire terms, she wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, she was quite loud and pushy, um, a little bit abrasive. And... Um, when I introduced her to Julian, she bound across the room and said to him, oh, hello, how old are you? And it, it sort of just put me off a little, really. Um, but then, having said that, uh, I then put, spoke to Paul Stead, the managing director of Daisy Beck, and Paul was a different kettle of fish altogether. Paul said to me, look, Peter, he said, I'm aware of your concerns about the media. And he used a phrase, he said, Peter, he said, I will not let you down. Of all your concerns, I will never let you down. And he never has. And Paul has become a very, very good friend of mine. And at that point, I still wasn't certain, though, in 2014. So it dragged on into 2015 to just before Easter. And he said, look, Peter, we're going to have to have a decision from you. And I suppose you can gather from that, Fiona, I'm a bit of a dither. So I said, I'll give you over Easter weekend to make your mind up. So that was on the Thursday before Good Friday. So on the Tuesday after Easter, uh, I picked the phone up, not knowing what I was going to say at that point. And he reiterated the words, I will not let you down. You trust me, Peter, I won't let you down. And I said, go on then, Paul. I said, send a, uh, a camera person in and do what you have to do. Uh, I said, we'll give it a go for a day. And if it's... Uh, if it doesn't work for us, then we'll call it a day. And I said, have you got someone else lined up just in case we don't, uh, we don't go ahead? He said, yes, I have. I thought, great. Because one thing I do not like to do, I never like to let anyone down. So on the Tuesday when I spoke to him and he said that, I thought, right, we'll go ahead. And the following day, a lady came in with a camera. Um, she didn't have two heads. She was very, very unobtrusive, very professional. She would pop up and make a cup of tea when we wanted one. She was so likeable. And it just went from there. And I've got to say, over the years, the Daisy Beck team have become very much part of the Scaldale family. Um, we just, they just turn up. They're with us every day. And uh, we just do our work. And if there's anything exciting or interesting comes along, then they follow us to it.
Well, that's lovely to hear. And what what a story of of of, of having to go through all that to decide yes or no. And you pick up the phone not knowing what your answer is going to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And yet, and yet, uh, thank heavens that you said yes because it's become such a popular program and it's become such a part of your and uh, your and Julian's life, I imagine, and the practices as well. So, have you had any regrets well, about it ever? No, never had any regrets. But when we uh, initiated the pilot series of six episodes to start with, I did say to Paul, "Look, Paul, you're a Yorkshireman. I'm a Yorkshireman, and." I don't want to waste your money, but no one will watch it for the simple reason it's all been done before. So I said, you wasted your money, really. And every time I speak to Paul now, he'll say, well, Victor, you were wrong, weren't you? And uh, I suppose I was wrong. And But I'm a, I'm a pessimist by nature. And, uh, you know, Paul never ever lets me forget. And I'm absolutely thrilled with the number of fans that we have that follow us, very, very dedicated, loyal fans. And I have met quite a number over the years at the Great Yorkshire Show, uh, Countryside Live, and uh, people that's just knocked on the door at Scaldale and wanted to meet us. And uh, that happened to be only this morning. And uh, it's lovely, really. Yeah. And I mean, you said yourself about when you were talking about in the, the love you have for, for what you do as a vet and how every birth is different, every event is different. And I suppose that, that that's the essence of what, what comes through in the program is that it's about people and it's about animals and, and their characters. And each one is a story and that it's picking up on those kind, those kind of stories. And I don't think from what I've, I've seen of it, it doesn't dwell too much on the sad side of, 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 of the equation of, of looking after animals. It's a very, very... Um, fulfilling it's a very very enlightening approach but it's one that's fundamentally hopeful i mean you say you're not you're, you tend to be a pessimist but the program itself is very optimistic i would say you know so it's it's about characters and you must have come across an awful lot of characters i mean james herriot's books were based on those characters uh, and you must equally come across a similar set of characters in the day job that you do we still have quite a few characters about, not as many as there were during the hurried times, but we still have a few about. And uh, after we started to make the uh, the programme, I said to Lynn when I got home one night, my wife, I said, um, why do people watch this? And, uh, and I think she hit the nail on the head. She said, they're not really interested in you and Julian. She said, the main stars of the programme are the animals. And, and I think she's absolutely right. And uh, we just turn up and, and do our job. And uh, and I think that, that 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 said it all for me, and I've never forgotten those words of hers, really. Yeah. And have you got any particular memorable moments you can think about when when you've been uh, you've been out filming, etc. Et and how you said that the uh, camera operator was very unobtrusive, and and that they become part of the family. Um, how does that sort of work? So tell me about something memorable, but then about how it actually works. Well, it works very easily, really, because they will uh, keep an eye on reception. I think they've got very, very acute hearing, these people, uh, being the media. And uh, so the, the, the ears will start to wag if the hearing reception is talking about something that they may be interested in. And uh, I remember going out to a, a, a cow, uh, to carve a cow, uh, and it was quite dark. Um, because they, they, they'll stay with us and we'll, they'll work with us during the night if necessary. This was six or seven, between 6 and 7 p.m. one evening in winter and I had to go and carve a cow for a local farmer. It's a chap I've known obviously for the last 40 plus years and um, we, um, the, 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 they'd already got the uh, cow in the cattle crush and they, they were filming away and um, I didn't realise I was really concentrating on my job and it's one of the few occasions that I've had to take my top off. And I've said, you know, Julian enjoys taking his top off and uh, for good reasons, because he has a good figure, whereas mine isn't quite as toned as his. So I, um, I tend to keep mine on. But the, the calf was uh, in, the, uh, in the uterus, it was quite way in. And I just needed that extra inch of reach. So I had to take my top off. And... Uh, as I did so, I was working away, using working at my fingertips to try and get this head uh, tilted to a, a presentation position for giving birth. And the cow must have coughed. And um, 
I got covered in, um, well, I tend to think of it as chewed grass, and I got covered <laughs> in, uh, in, in cow feces. And um, anyway, I cleaned it off as best I could, but I was concentrating so intently on my work that I forgot all about this. And then um, I, um, I did uh, slip a shirt on. So, like a lot of farmers, there isn't really good washing facilities afterwards. So I, I cleaned off my torso, forgot all about my face, and then I had to call and get some, uh, some petrol in the car on the way home. And as I walked in through the door, I saw this lady sort of do a double take. And then I, I kept on walking, didn't think anything about it. And then when I got in to pay for my, my petrol, this lady looked at me, she said, um, I don't know what it is on your face, but she said, I think you need to go and have a look in the mirror. And <laughs> then, that's when it does. So when I got back in the car, I looked in the mirror and I, was, I literally looked as, I, as, as if someone had just flung a whole load of dung at me. And I, I, I wasn't aware. And, you know, you get so engrossed in your work. And the cam, the David was on the cam, he never told me either. But I think he, <laughs> before he found it very, very amusing. And that's what I like, really, with these people. You, we have, they have a fantastic sense of humour. And, and with people that I've worked with, such as David Terry, who I've worked with literally from the word go, he only has to twitch an eyebrow sometimes when we're doing a summing up afterwards. And I know he wants it seen in a slightly different format. So we have just this fantastic working relationship. Oh, that's wonderful to hear, but not surprising from our, uh, our Daisy Beck. I mean, we're blessed in Yorkshire by having wonderful independent production companies, so it's, it's good to hear. And you talked about the impact of, of having fans now and, and things like that. Uh, how, do you, how do you cope then with the fact that you are recognised now out on the street? You can just be out anywhere and somebody could come up to you. And also, is there an international reach to this as well? Well, <laughs> about three years ago, we went to India to, um, uh, to go down the, uh, the Golden Triangle. And I was standing in awe, looking at the Taj Mahal, at this magnificent spectacle. And I had a tap on the shoulder. And as I turned around, there's a, a married couple standing there. And this chap said, uh, we know you from somewhere. And um, I said, I'm... Uh, Peter, he said, I know you are, before I even got the words down. He said, you're the vet. And these people were from Melbourne, Australia, and they get the series there. So there I was in India, being recognised from uh, people in, in Australia. And I found that quite surreal, I, I suppose, really. And certainly when we've been in other places like Malta, um, in, in, in the Netherlands, I've been recognised quite frequently. And I find it quite amusing, really. Yeah, what but, do you uh, I love it when... Sorry, Sorry, Fiona. I was thinking, what do your family make of it? Well, they, they, just, they just accept it. And uh, they, I think they find it quite amusing. Um, and when we made um, the, 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 the... I was very flattered, really, and, and quite humbled by the fact that um, Channel 5 commissioned a programme called The Peter Wright Story, uh, which went out a few weeks ago. And... Um, my, my, my brother was interviewed on there, and his, 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 his summing up words were, Peter Wright, our lad, I could never see him as a television star, as a television personality. And, and I think that sums it up, really. I never consider myself a celebrity. I'm just a vet who does my job. I enjoy my job. And I think what's given me the greatest satisfaction, though, Fiona, is, 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 is the children that's come to the practice. Some of these children, it's quite amusing really, when the, the, the chatter away, the parents under the chatter away, then the mother will say, um, you've lost your tongue, haven't you now? And they lose their tongue when they actually meet you. And the other thing that I've had, uh, we, we've done uh, one or two make a wish programs, and we've had various children who have had quite serious illnesses. And this has given me the most fantastic Really, that it's 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 been quite humbling. Really, that that the 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 way these children cope with the disabilities, and the pleasure they've had just from meeting very humble me, and I find that quite something. Really, if truth be told. Well, that's lovely that you still feel like that because after I think twelve series, you could be feeling quite kind of you know complacent about it or whatever, but you don't. You feel still humbled about. No. It. 
I think if they want to come and see me, it's the least I can do. Yeah. And now, I, in some of the programmes, you get referred to as Mr. Testicle. <laughs> <laughs> I watched one the other day where there were four kittens laid out in a kind of, in, in a row, in a production line as you went along, yeah. being the testicle with each one. How did you get, who gave you that name or did you give it yourself? No, I didn't. And it, I wasn't aware until uh, it was pointed out to me how many uh, castrations of one species or another there's nothing to do. And um, we often say, you know, technically it's not a difficult operation. The hard bit is persuading your patient that he needs to part with them. Yeah. That's the hard And uh, certainly when you're dealing with unruly bulls, there's nothing more true than that. Um, so, yes, it's a case of sometimes catch a patient. And uh, we've had one or two instances of that on the, uh, on the Yorkshire vet where the holding facility might not have been as robust as it should have been. Um, but it, it, I, I, find it, I, I find it quite amusing and I, I don't take myself too seriously, Fiona. And, and I think as a vet, um, you can't because, you know, you sometimes think things are going so well, your patients are getting better, and then there's something that knocks you flat on your back, something doesn't work out as well as you would expect, and, you, and you, by God, it doesn't have to ground you again then. And, and that's why I don't get carried away with anything anymore. Uh, I'm very philosophical about everything that I do. Yeah. Well, there are times as well when you must have to give people very bad news and have to uh, euthanize pets and animals, etc. And that must be a difficult thing to have to learn to do, how to do that effectively, because people are so attached to their animals. I mean, I speak from personal experience of having had to make that decision myself for animals. Uh, so you know that we. How do you? How did you actually learn how to do that? To do that in a caring, empathetic way. I don't think you can learn it, Fiona. Really, um, when we get young vets come to work at the practice, I tell all of them, you cannot until you've been through it yourself, personally, and lost these animals which are part of your family. You cannot understand what a client is going through. And so I said, try and put yourself in their shoes. That's, that's the first thing. And the other thing that, that, that clients want to be able to do, they want the end to be as swift and painless as possible. And I think once you've made a decision, once they've made a decision, or you've made a joint decision that it's the right thing to do, then I think the best thing you can do is not let them linger. Get it over with once you've made that decision, as quickly as possible. Because I had to wait, um, going back in time, for a vet to come and put one of my cats to sleep. This is going back a long time now. And I waited about three hours. Uh, the vet was busy and I understood that. But in the end, I thought, no, I just cannot wait anymore. It drove me mad. And in the end, I did it myself. And I felt relief afterwards. And I tell everybody who have had their animals put to sleep, you must not feel guilty for what you've done. You have made the right decision. And if it had been the wrong decision, then I would have gone away and we would have continued. And so you must never feel guilty. And I think a lot of people, when they're psyching themselves up to it, I think they almost feel a sense of relief afterwards as well, because it pays on the mind for such a time that the decision has to be made. So when it's over with, I say to them, look, go and have a good stiff gin and tonic when you get home and you'll feel a lot better. And don't, don't think of the sad bits. Look back with happy memories as to what that pet's given you, because they give you an awful lot, and no one can ever take your memories away. That's so true. It's such good, it's such good advice. Um, I want to just move on to a bit, a bit more chipper than that, perhaps, and that, that's what I call the goggle box effect. And I, you know, I'm a great fan of Gogglebox, and I always think that if Gogglebox had been around when I was making programs and they covered one of my programs, I'd have been absolutely made up and delighted. Uh, how did you feel when you realised that Gogglebox was featuring the Yorkshire vet and that they love it? Well, I, I find it uh, amusing, really. And what I find particularly amusing is, is, is the large um, spread of character that they have on the programme. And it's very interesting seeing members of the public reaction to what you're actually doing. 
and you know some of the more gory stuff shall we say <laughs> that, that we take for granted and then it's very interesting to see what the public reaction is to it uh, and I find that amusing we um, the, the, the sharp the Daily Mail critic I, I looked at um, his review um, on on one occasion and he only gave us two stars and I was a bit miffed and when I read his critique basically that that particular episode was too gory for him now I didn't think it was but obviously you've got to try and understand what's going go for us it's not going for us can be extremely upsetting sometimes for members of the public so i think watching gogglebox it, it brought to me uh, an array of different uh, feelings emotions and, and reactions to what the public feel about the program yeah I think it's a good barometer. It's a good barometer. And if you're going to watch a program about vets, then there's going to be gore in there every now and again. It's a bit like watching programs about surgeons, isn't it? You're going to get gore. Uh, well, you mentioned it earlier, Fiona, that, you know, we've got to be careful. Yes, we do put uh, some stories in with a feel-good factor, but we also throw in one or two sad events as well. Because if you sanitise it too much, it doesn't become a true portrayal of what you actually do. Yeah, no, that's very, very true. So, Peter, what, what do you think the future holds for you and for the programme? It sounds like you're going to carry on being a vet forever and ever and ever. Uh, but what's your hope for yourselves and for the programme? Well, I have, for my sins now, having done 39 years now, and I'm tick 39 off, um, I have started working part-time, yeah. uh, but that's allowed me to do uh, filming bits that... Um, in some ways give me more time to devote to the Yorkshire vet um, and I was quite proud of the fact that despite saying to Paul Stead that nobody will watch it that we uh, last month celebrated the 100th episode of the Yorkshire vet um, and that was quite a, yeah that was quite quite a thing really um, and, um, and, and so you know we are working on, on the next series now and um, as long as Channel 5 want us, you know, we'll, we'll probably be, be, be there for them. That's great, Peter. And you said that Paul had said to you that he wouldn't let you down, and he hasn't. Never. And I can say to you, you know, you haven't let us down. The Yorkshire Vet, your team with Julian, etc., haven't let us down. So I think that's a big thank you from me for being part of this RTS Yorkshire Talks conversation. It's been really great talking to you. Um, Thank you for your I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, jolly good show. And I hope to see you again soon when we can all get back together again uh, uh, outside the, 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 the lockdown, etc. But for now, I think that's it, it for us. So, thank you very much, Fiona. Well, thank you. And thank you to everybody who's watching this and hope to see you again here on RTS Yorkshire Talks. Take care. <laughs>